I'm Jochen Eisenchart, and I'll be talking to Nathan Abrams, professor in film at Bangor University and author of several books, including Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick, and The Making of His Final Film. He is currently completing the Bloomsbury Companion to Stanley Kubrick, but today we're going to discuss his 2018 book, Stanley Kubrick, New York Jewish Intellectual, published by Rutgers University Press, which is about to appear in paperback. Uh, welcome, Nathan. Good to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, uh, thank you for, for um, uh, joining me. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the book. It's really, really interesting, full of um, uh, fantastic themes. And of course, um, dealing with a, um, a really important body of work by, by Kubrick. So um, the obvious uh, thing to start with, I guess, is um, the fact that uh, Kubrick seems to avoid overtly Jewish themes and characters in his films. Um, and, uh, and yet you, you find, you know, uh, Judaism and, and, uh, and Jewish themes everywhere in his work. Um, so can you give us a few of ex examples of the sorts of things that you've, um, uh, that you've talked about in your book? Um, yes, certainly. Um, so what I'd like to point out initially is that Kubrick was um, born to two Jewish parents and um, yeah, he didn't show any interest in religion. Um, but even if one doesn't show any religion, interest in religion when you're Jewish, you're still Jewish. And um, he was interested in intellectual, cultural, um, gastronomic and ethical Jewish concerns. And that's what I find in the book. Now, the other thing to say that um, to, to, to say is that Kubrick um, was a filmmaker from the 1950s onwards. And he very much fitted in with the impulse in Jewish cultural production, which was the downplay over Jewishness, um, particularly with commercial considerations in mind. So whilst there might be Jewish themes beneath the surface, um, the reason, one of the reasons he might have expunged them from being explicit was so as not to limit the appeal of his films to people who didn't necessarily want to watch Jews or Jewish films. Mm -hmm. um, so to give examples of his movie, from his movies, well, there's, there's, there's hundreds in the, book, um, in the book. I mean, I should also point out as well that um, what I'm proposing in the book is a reading strategy or an interpretive approach. So I'm not trying to claim that Kubrick's films uh, were deliberately about Jewish things and Judaism, um, nor am I trying to claim that they're only about it. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to add is another interpretation to the reams of interpretation of Kubrick and one that I think has been overlooked and missed for a director that grew up in a Jewish milieu and worked in a very Jewish profession, the movies. Right. So examples. Uh, I mean, we could probably flesh out in more details, but I look at 2001 as being a Kabbalistic film. Um, for example, I look at a lot of the religious imagery in that movie, most of which in the past has been interpreted as being Christian. And I argue, actually, it's much more Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, if we take Eyes Wide Shut, his final film that was based on a novel by a Jewish author, um, uh, Arthur Schnitzler, and it was about a Jewish couple and um, seemingly whitewashed when he cast Bill and Alice Hartwood in the lead roles. Mm. I can elaborate on any of this as you wish. Okay, um, so you say it wasn't necessarily deliberate. I mean, I can, I can see the, um, you know, the, uh, the wish to be mainstream for commercial reasons, um, but somebody like Woody Allen, you know, foregrounded his Jewishness and it certainly didn't do him any harm. Um, so why do you think there's this difference? And I think Woody Allen's making his films in the later decades, um, <clears throat> he's really coming to prominence at least a decade, probably two decades after Kubrick begins making movies. And that's a very different uh, context in which to make films. Um, you know, post-1968, there's much more coming out of, or 67, should I say, there's much more coming out of Jewishness in the movies. If you think of um, Barbara Streisand and Dustin Hoffman mm. in 
and Funny Girl and um, The Graduate, respectively. So, but Kubrick starting his movie career almost two decades before that. And I think his impulse was formed in that period and therefore um, kind of stuck with him. One of the uh, other things one should say is there's a wide gulf between the types of films that um, Woody Allen makes and Kubrick makes or made in that Woody Allen's appeal is very niche and independent and, and probably the place where he does best is Paris. Um, whereas Kubrick's films have global appeal and mass market appeal in yeah, I mean, all of his films. Yeah. But, but I mean, you know, Woody Allen hard. did have some, did have, definitely had hits in the seventies, didn't he? Yeah, but not in the not in the same way as um, I mean, one would probably have to do, compare the data, but not in the same way as Kubrick's big films were hits. <clears throat> not to say that Woody Allen's films weren't hits; they're just um, Kubrick's aimed at a bigger, broader market. Um, so, so there's a world of difference in the types of films they're making, and, and therefore, um, it's only later on, I would say. Uh, much later on that people are making mainstream commercial movies with Jewish characters in and overtly Jewish th uh, themes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you say somewhere that uh, Kubrick was known to have said that he was not really a Jew, he just happened to, be, to have two Jew Jewish parents. So that suggests that, you know, he, at least th there was an ambivalent relationship to, relationship to his own uh, Jewish background. Um, so uh, you say he didn't necessarily uh, incorporate these uh, Jewish themes deliberately. Um, so do you think there's a sense in which he was like repressing something that was coming out, that was then coming out uh, in unconscious ways, in a kind of a Freudian hydraulic um, sense? Um, well, there's three ways to answer that question. One, we can't necessarily take everything he says at face value. Um, I think Kubrick, um, I've learned from speaking to people who knew him and worked with him, Kubrick had a sense of humour and he liked to goad people. So right. if you took a statement out of context, so for example, he said to Frederick Raphael, Adolf Hitler or A.H. was right about almost everything. But if you look at that and you think, well, he's an anti-Semite, he's a self-hater, so that's one response. Or the other thing is he was goading Frederick Raphael, who was also Jewish. So um, right. one way to treat those statements. Um, secondly, he might very well have put none of this in his movies without his conscious intention. Right. I said at the beginning, this is an interpretive strategy um, for, an, for an alternative way to read, well, not just Kubrick's films, but... Mm any films where there's not overt or explicit Jewishness and and to be fair it doesn't even have to be Jewishness you could apply this strategy to any group uh, who are able to pass uh, as, as white so um, it could be Irish um, or Catholics um, so it's an interpretive strategy it's, it's 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 arguing that if we locate his body of work within different sources to what's been used, we can come up with different interpretations. And now the third thing is, is that um, I do agree, I think Kubrick did have an ambivalent relationship to his Jewishness, in as much as he knew he was Jewish, um, that was inescapable, he, he, he looked Jewish, uh, his daughters even said so, um, and um, it wasn't a thing necessarily worth reflecting on, it was just a fact. Right. And, and therefore, it wasn't deliberate suppression. It was just something maybe he wasn't interested in discussing. Um, or he wanted to, but felt that would limit the appeal of his movies, like I said earlier. If people yeah. just thought of Jewish movies, they won't get the box office appeal mm. that, um, that, that if he makes them general movies. And if you look at mid-50s, mid-century cultural production, especially amongst Jewish American authors, like the greatest kind of writers and authors of the, of the 50s, 40s and 50s, uh, are, are people like Arthur Miller, Saul Bellow, Norman Mailer, who, who were trying to be American, yeah. rather than Jewish writers, and have been accepted as canonical American writers, rightly or wrongly. 
even though when one reads their work, one can see Jewish themes in there. I mean, uh, Catch-22, Joseph Heller would be a classic example. Not a Jew in the book, but it's a very Jewish book. Mm. So this is all part of a kind of assimilatory post-war drive um, amongst uh, uh, Jewish Americans who, who, who uh, uh, you know, wrote for general audiences. It's only when we start to get people like Philip Roth a bit later on that it gets much more kind of um, what one might say parochial. Right. 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 Um, So, yeah, we could psychoanalyze it and suggest there's an ambivalent relationship. Some people might use the term self-hatred. I just think that's far too easy to sort of get out for anything that we disagree with. Right. Um, So uh, you call the book um, New York Jewish Intellectual. Um, and you mentioned these, you know, these other people, um, Arthur Miller, Saul Bellow, and so on. Um, uh, so did he um, sort of, was he part of that gang in a way that you used to hang out with them? Did, you know, were they kind of aware that, 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 that there was a kind of a, a critical mass of, of these people who, uh, you know, were coming to prominence at that time who shared that background? Um, well, all right, so I've called it New York Jewish Intellectual um, because what I wanted to do was suggest that Kubrick's an intellectual filmmaker. One of the reasons why his films endure is his films contain ideas. They're not just incredibly well made and push the envelope technically or technologically, but they also contain ideas. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that, that uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, for example, was discussed uh, over 50 years later. I'm embroiled in an argument about it right now on Facebook. Um, so, so that's the first thing. Secondly, when you look at where Kubrick was um, living in, in after World War II in Greenwich Village, that was kind of the center of New York's bohemian intellectual uh, world. And um, there's lots of ideas flowing around there, you know, existentialism, Marxism, psychoanalysis. And that was the point at which this group of um, intellectuals uh, uh, arose, came to prominence around small magazines like Commentary and Partisan Review, who subsequently were labelled the New York Intellectuals mm-hmm. um, by one of their members. Now that was a specific group with a kind of membership. Now uh, Kubrick wasn't a part of that group. What I was suggesting, he's part of a group of alternative Jewish intellectuals. Okay. who are very similar, but don't have that official title. So one might then look to the the sort of beats like Allen Ginsberg. Mm-hmm. Um, one might look to the uh, um, to Bob Dylan, for example, the music of Bob Dylan, or the uh, Mad Magazine, the cartoons of Mad Magazine, or, or Jules Pfeiffer. Um, I've mentioned Joseph Heller already. There's a whole group of alternative Jewish intellectuals. The ones that Kubrick was most closely aligned with were the ones around. Um, the sort of beat magazines, uh, The Realist and Neurotica. And there was a group of um, like Paul Krasner, Jay Landsman. So there was this uh, group of alternative Jewish intellectuals. Obviously their paths probably would have crossed, but this alternative didn't have the label. Mm. To all intents and purposes, they were engaged in the same debates uh, um, as, as the New York intellectuals were. The New York intellectuals had their own kind of membership as it were yeah yeah i mean some of those uh, some, some of the uh the personality you mentioned could come into the into the hippie era don't they um uh, uh, uh but but kubrick doesn't really he's he he seems to bypass that he seems to start before that and then you know it, it doesn't seem to me that he's you know he's not the easy easy rider kind of filmmaker is he but well that well he is actually if we're going to chart it that way um so if we think really that the new left and counterculture kind of hits in the 60s, if you look at Kubrick's uh, three films of the 60s, Lolita uh, in 62, Dr. Strangelove in 64, and then, and, and then um, 2001 and 68, they are very kind of countercultural films. So we'll start the first one. Lolita is very much skewering the kind of mainstream intellectual concerns of psychoanalysis, intellectual pretension, bohemianism. It has uh, uh, allusions to beatniks in there, um, um, to, to uh, you know, multiple sexual partners, swinging. You know, it's very much fitting in with the early 60s, you know, view move towards free love, and, but it's also ch- attacking the kind of, 
older bourgeois generation. It's, it's a lampoon or a satire in the Mad Magazine mold that very much draws upon the emerging black humour of Lenny Bruce, Mort Sahl and others. Mm. Um, when we move to Dr. Strangelove, that takes it one step further. I mean, that, 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 that really pushes the envelope in terms of sexual jokes, uh, punning, uh, a, a film in which um, the fate of the earth is, is compared to sex or going to the toilet, um, in which um, the opening sequence is of two jets, one of which is a nuclear bomber refueling in a very sexual, suggestive fashion, and it ends with a huge nuclear uh, uh, orgasm, it climaxes in a nuclear orgasm. So, and that, that was one of the first countercultural films. There's a trilogy of countercultural films um, Doctor Strange Love, um, Catch 22 and MASH, and, and, and this was the first one. The first one to really attack the US military, government, politicians. And then 68, we get, um, the, we get, we get 2001. Um, which very much appealed with the countercultural generation. They loved it. That movie did very well with under 30s. Over 30s hated it. And it was very much part of that new wave of filmmaking that you referred to when you mentioned Easy Rider. So there's a lot of new wave influences in 2001 um, that, that are similar to the, that sort of late 60s um, um, new wave. So in a sense, I think these 60s films very much fit in with new left and countercultural ideas. Yeah, I, I mean, some of the, the sort of the, the, the style of the films are, you know, quite alternative as well. You get very long takes, uh, you know, um, scenes without much dialogue and so on. And, you know, right up to Eyes Wide Shut as well. So he wasn't necessarily, he doesn't all necessarily feel like he's aiming at, you know, a, a mainstream commercial market in some of those in some of those um, ways of doing it. No, I mean, arguably Kubrick's looking for a new cinematic grammar every time he's making a film. He's looking to do something new, to, to, to like change something. Uh, you know, 2001 is almost a silent movie, barely anything said in it, and it's got intertitles, mm. uh, like a silent movie. Um, um, and a score that could be played independently. Mm. You see what I'm to do yeah. to the, because it's all non-diegetic music, so... Um, you could sync it up, but you didn't need to have a source in the movie mm. yeah, in the same way. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, I think that's the kind of genius of Kubrick in Awareness Films is that he's making mainstream commercial movies, but using non-mainstream art house influences and ways to do it yeah. and ways to tell stories and, and to challenge viewers. I mean, look at Full Metal Jacket. That's a movie of two halves, um, for example. Barely anything said in 2001 and the use of classical music revolutionary uh, dot, um, clockwork orange the use of classical music and the way that's edited and then uh, to fit the movie which is edited to fit the music mm. beaded up and, and, and use of electronic uh, uh, and, and cla in classical music so um, arguably one of the reasons why his movies have survived is because they're not so rooted in a period as to only be a reflection of that period now you might watch Casablanca and think, well, that's a fantastic film. Yeah. And I want to watch that 50 times. But Casablanca is a film from its era. Mm. And, you know, not, you know, so are Kubrick's films, but for different reasons. But when you look at them, you can look at them afresh and think, well, they haven't dated in how they look. At least it's mature movies. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I wanted to um, uh, discuss uh, a couple of, um, uh, concepts that you use w for which you have um, these Yiddish names, so Menschlichkeit and uh, Goyim Nachas, yeah. uh, and you use those quite a lot to um, uh, um, to kind of label different aspects of different characters and so on, and, and different um, themes in the movies. So could you start by just explaining what what those terms uh, mean? Well, Menschlichkeit um, is the idea, so a mensch is a fine, decent, upstanding human being, you know, ethical. A menschlichkeit is the, uh, um, is the, is the um, what would one say, the, the, the belief system around that. Um, <coughs> um, so, uh, uh, um, and its opposite is goyim nachis. 
um, so the uh, um, pleasure of or for the Gentiles, um, which was to do much more with, um, and this was this was the um, pejorative term that Jews came up with to deride things that Gentiles. That was very stereotypical, you know, hunting. Um, you, know, you can see this in lots of movies these days. Uh, Meet the Fockers, and Greg Fokker goes duck hunting, much to the disgust of his father. And his father says, "Gaylord, our people don't shoot ducks." <laughs> so, so that's going nachos. You know, everything. Uh, you know, uh, in the old days, it would have been dueling, courtly love, uh, um, riding horses, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, things that Jews were forbidden from doing. Um, and, and one of the things I'm suggesting is Kubrick sets up binary oppositions in his movies. He contrasts one thing with the other. And one of the ways that he does that, I'm arguing beneath the surface, is, is this sense of this, this underlying sense of Jewish decency, or at least we should aspire to it, versus the kind of much more bodily, rash, thoughtless, cold, cruel Goyam Right. So it, it's... Goyim Nachas are like, they're things that you're not allowed to do, but they're also things that you despise. Um, yeah, you're forbidden you're from... Yeah, if you're a mensch, you're about looking after people, community, doing the right thing. Right. If you're the opposite, you're selfish. Instantaneous pleasure, rashness, right. bodily pleasure. The interesting thing about the word Goyim, Goy in the Bible is nation. Uh, um, uh, but it's turned into the kind of pejorative Yiddish term for non-Jews. Um, but it's related, uh, I read, to um, the Hebrew word for body, which is gvia. Right. Uh, uh, so the suggestion implicit in this word is it's not just goyish pleasures, but bodily pleasures. Right. The right. pleasures are rooted in the body. Jewish pleasures, Yiddish pleasures, are rooted in the brain, the mind. Right, right, okay. So I mean, these are characterizations. Yeah. There are stereotypes of, of Jews by Jews and of non-Jews by Jews. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you you kind of ascribe uh, Menschlichkeit to the various heroes, um, thinking of um, Dax and uh, Joker and Spartacus, um, and you know, they, they're brave, they're kind, they're empathetic, they're thoughtful, they have family values and all those things. And um, it, it strikes me that, you know, or, or, you know, can I ask you, aren't they just simply hero qualities? You know, the sorts, the sorts of qualities that we expect any hero um, in a narrative to have, rather than Jew specifically Jewish qualities. Yeah, I mean, yes, one could say that. I mean, but then one could argue that, that you know, who makes most movies? Therefore, who writes these underlying qualities into, uh, <laughs> into most heroes? But yeah, I mean, yes, I'm not disputing that. But what I think is it's, um, it's this sort of combination of toughness with, with decency um, and, 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 and this sort of intellectual decency that I think makes them um, heroes in one sense. Um, and in the movies they appear, they're obviously con they're, uh, they're contrasted with their others, where they're much more one-dimensional. So if you take Dax that in, in Paths of Glory, played by Kirk Douglas, not only he's a good soldier, but he cares about his men, whereas the generals only care about promotion. Right. And advancement. Spartacus is constantly contrasted with the Romans. I mean, that's the binary opposites yeah. throughout. Yeah. You know. Spartacus, tough, brave, a warrior, um, but cares about his flock, whereas the Romans don't. Hmm. And, you know, arguably the, the counterpoint there is that Draba, who's the Thracian, uh, not the Thracian, the uh, Ethiopian, I think they call him, who's, who's killed early on in the movie, that sparks off Spartacus's rebellion, isn't Jewish, um, but exhibits this Menschlichkeit. Right. That, which, which um, Kubrick... Right which Spartacus realises um, right, right. And, and needs him to become something more than just a, a gladiator. Um, and then in Joker, for me in Joker, it, it, it's that world, it's that cynicism. It's that um, he constantly undermines the dominant narrative with his jokes right from the very moment he opens his mouth is that 
is that me, John Wayne, is this you? And contrast him to Hartman and then the other characters he meets along the way and clashes with, you can see that his heroic qualities are much more, much less one dimensional than theirs. Yeah. And um, um, so that, that's how I'm arguing in, in, in there. Um, and because they emanate from the mind of a Jewish filmmaker, I'm suggesting that he's ascribed those qualities. Right. <clears throat> right. Um, so uh, this, uh, this uh, sort of combination of the mensch and the macho is quite interesting because, you know, in one sense, the 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 mensch qualities are they're not martial qualities are they but as you say they're intellectual qualities and you you write at some point about um you know how how you know this the, the, this is not a kind of an aggressive stance it's not an ag aggressive way of being and yet you know these are very macho guys um, yeah. you know they're, they're in in uh, in situations of war of conflict and you know they're they're brave they stand up to people um so how how um how can you talk a little bit about how menschlichkeit and macho-ness you know are combined and how to what extent do you think they are compatible well i mean i talk about this this idea of the blending of the two of the macho mensch that that, that one sees in the 50s movies not just in kubrick's 50s movies but in others how they blend the idea of the moral warrior so who's both strong and tough, but also moral too. Mm. Um, and so in a sense, that, that, that's breaking the binary. Um, but they're still contrasted with their others by being macho and brave uh, and moral, whereas the others are immoral um, and or not even brave in the case of, say, Paths of Glory. Um, so we, we do see, and in the characters, I mean, well, I accept you know, in the characters that I have read Jewish qualities into, some of them are extremely violent, mm. like Alex in A Clockwork Orange. Mm. Um, so, so there's a sort of more of a nuance there where these binaries are, are, are collapsed and folded into one another rather than just being simply passive, weak Jews. I mean, that's the other thing is arguably Kubrick's reacting to that notion of the weak, passive Jew. Yeah. That, was slaughtered by their millions in the Holocaust, you know, that, that, that notion. Um, and therefore, um, the tough macho Jew um, is, is, is what some might see as the fulfillment of the Zionist dream. Although what his views on Israel are, I actually don't know. Right. Um, but, you know, he's presumably reading books like Exodus by Leon Uris, and uh, um, which you know, got made into the film that, that Dalton Trumbo also wrote the screenplay for as he was writing Spartacus. So what I'm trying to argue is, is that when one looks at what Kubrick read, what we know he read, and then what we assume he read, and put him in that context, and then, and then put his films in that milieu, then the possibility of reading them in this way emerges. So like I said, if, is Kubrick reading Lewin Uris? Um, I assume so. They were bestsellers. Yeah. He was yeah. Bella. Um, yeah, he was interested in adapting Henderson, the Rain King. You know, I could go on like that. So when one, one shifts him and puts him into that kind of intellectual Jewish cultural production media where these stereotypes are being played with and, and discussed, and then, then, you know, and one says, well, huh, if I put that next to that, which we've made at the same time, then um, maybe we can make this reading. Yeah. Yeah, but people have done that. I mean, the clearest example would be um, 1962 Lolita, the characterization of Charlotte Hayes, played by Shelley Winters, who won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in the Diary of Anne Frank three years earlier, as a Jewish, you know, a Jewish refugee hiding in the attic with Anne Frank's family. Um, and then you look at the kind of fiction that's coming out this time about blousy, overbearing, vulgar Jewish mothers, and you think, well, he put a Jewish woman in this role. Um, and then, and then characterize in a way that matches the Jewish fiction of the era. It's not such a stretch to make the reading that perhaps she's not explicitly, but we can read her as Jewish. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you quote Anna Kubrick 
uh, where she says, I suppose the single improvement one might hope for in the world would be an acceptance of this Jungian view of the duality of man by those who see themselves as good and externalize all evil. And uh, don't you come quite close to doing that when you sort of contrast, um, you know, Mensch with Goy, um, uh, Menschlichkeit with Goy Nachas, human with animal. And, you know, you basically come out that, you know, um, sounds like Jewish is good and Goy is bad. Yeah, from a Jewish perspective, one might characterize it that way. It's a stereotype. Just as from an anti-Semite perspective, Jew is bad, Goy, uh, Goy is good. <laughs> But I don't think I reduce it to that in the book. If you look at the examples I use, um, these people are, I read as Jewish and as evil at the same time. So Alex in The Clockwork Orange, no one's going to suggest is good. Right. Uh, and that was part of the complexity of the character that, uh, that, that appealed to Kubrick. Um, if we look in um, Dr. Strangelove in 64, one of the crew in the final bombing run is, is, is Jewish and he could have changed that he wrote many Jewish characters out of his source text that he adapted this one he kept in so the Jewish characters implicated in the destruction of the world which is effectively one mass genocide in a film that, that, that contrasts nuclear holocaust with the holocaust um, later on Joker and, and as part of I read these Jewish qualities into as part of the lean green killing machine yeah. the US Marines in 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 in, in Vietnam. Um, so and and probably the most evil character in uh, Eyes Wide Shut is Victor Ziegler, who um, I found the memo is even though he's played by Sidney Pollock, and therefore we can read him as Jewish, was conceived as a Jewish businessman, who some people compare to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, so so Kubrick's not saying just because you're Jewish you can't be evil. He's saying actually, you know, these if, if one agrees with this argument, then these characters can be Jewish and evil. And one of the things that influenced him is this idea that in that Hannah Arendt popularized when she covered the Eichmann trial back in the early 60s is that Jews were responsible for their own destruction. Okay, uh, um, it's, a, it's an unpopular um, divisive idea that Jews participated um in 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 their own uh destruction as it were by by uh, um you know in ways they were forced to do but they still went along with it um kubrick isn't isn't if you know whilst there are binary opposites and one and, and can see that he is accepting this duality of of humans of humanity and that includes jewish people mm. um, so you have to you have to sort of reconcile the fact that the most un unequivocally evil, evil character in um, Eyes Wide Shut is the one who's clearly the Jewish character. Right, right. Um, um, I, I mean, that duality is kind of inscribed literally on, on Joker, isn't, isn't it, with his um, peace badge and his born to kill um, uh, uh, slogan on his helmet. Um, I, yeah, I mean, that sort of um you know encapsulates the culture wars in the states really which you know which we're still in the throes of with with, with trump um and and of course which have their roots very much in in the vietnam conflict um how do you see kubrick in relation to that to the, to the culture wars yeah um well one of the things i'm trying to argue in the book is that kubrick used his films to comment on the key issues of its time of their time so i, I made that suggestion with the 60s and the um how, how it very much as 60s films fit into a kind of cancel cultural way of thinking you know in the, if you take lock work orange one could argue that's a neoconservative dream is that the um crime is uh, uh is brainwashed out of individuals right right um you know who wouldn't who, which right winger wouldn't love that um so uh you know one could make that that case um the movie um that probably makes the clearest intervention into these debates is full metal jacket and full metal jacket was made at a time when the vietnam war was going through a re-evaluation um so you had the early 80s cycle where films were much more gung-ho and pro-war 
and Ronald Reagan was trying to recast the Vietnam War as a noble affair and to resurrect America's reputation. Um, and then you get that later cycle, if you think um, Platoon just trumped, no pun intended, it just beat uh, um, Full Metal Jacket. These show a darker side to war. Mm. And that's Kubrick's intervention into, I suppose, one of the key de- kind of cultural war debates that divides the divide and divides America about where people stand on the Vietnam War. Yeah. Um, whether it was like the right policy but wrongly applied, or whether the whole thing was a um, unmitigated disaster and constituted war crimes. Right. So that's the clearest yeah. intervention um, uh, into that debate in in. In, in there so I mean and then his films get few and farther between right you know so really he's not really commenting on anything in his movies because there's another 12 years to another one comes out but but the, the argument I'm trying to suggest is he's reading that stuff you know whether it's articles books that are contributing to these debates mm-hmm. so he's immersing himself in them in them um, even whilst not necessarily directly commenting it on, on it in the movies uh, that he didn't make and then obliquely commenting it in the movies he did make. Right, right. Um, so uh, I think finally, um, I just wanted to talk about masculinity more generally. So we've talked about um, this sort of macho um, heroes and uh, you know the way that they display uh, uh, mentally kite, um, but just taking it as a, you, you know, as a kind of a varied portrayal of male virtues and, and male behavior. Um, uh, I mean, Four Metal Jacket is an obvious one where women almost don't appear. In fact, the, the only two I can think of, you know, um, in the main body of the film are the prostitutes um, who are being, you know, uh, incredibly suggestive and, and, you know, being addressed in a in not very, very respectful way. Um, and then at the end we have the enemy sniper um, who who is euthanized in this kind of quite you know horrible um, sort of symbolically sexual you might argue way um, and um, so I, I don't know women don't really figure and when when they do figure here it's you know it's, it's in a quite a troubling way I mean if one takes it even back further again, you know, to his first film, Fear and Desire, there's three women appear in that, three are fisher women, one who's played by his wife and one of whom is tied up to a tree um, and sexually assaulted and murdered. And uh, um, so, yeah, there is an argument that the, um, the way Kubrick depicts women in his films is misogynistic, that um, he has very few roles for women and um, when he does put them in there, they are confined to kind of you know, mothers or whores in a sense. Um, if we think of Lolita um, or Eyes Wide Shut, I mean, that's one view. Another way to look at it is in Full Metal Jacket, you know, well, how many women would have been there in the first half of the film? Probably none. Sure. On a military base. <laughs> yeah. Second half the Americans experience of Vietnamese women would have probably been akin to the ones that you mentioned. Um, you know, how much interaction would that, you know, that's a good question. How much interaction would there be in between the everyday soldiers, mm. the soldiers of the everyday population? Um, so one could suggest there's an element of realism to some of those depictions. Um, but I mean, in the main Kubrick is interested in the male condition yeah and and in homosocial environments i mean having said that though if one looks at eyes wide shut probably the strongest character in the movie is alice harford bill's wife and that's the one in which probably is the warmest depiction yeah so yeah um, yeah, there is a debate there and there is a there is something there is there is further work to be done on thinking about kubrick's movies from a feminist perspective you know, one might want to think about Kubrick in the Me Too era, but one also wants to think about the labour is often overlooked in film studies, and I didn't deal with it in my book, is the physical labour that goes into making a movie, i.e. the women who worked on his films, not simply the women who were depicted in his films. 
and those women also would have contributed to some of those um, representations. You know, one of the things we have to think about, I didn't do it in my book so much, is to decenter Kubrick. Kubrick is an auteur, but as an auteur, is not the only one responsible for making his films, and he was very open and to ideas of others. Mm. So what we could say is Kubrick was a misogynist and made all the people in his films look misogynist. Or we could say, well, actually, Kubrick worked in collaboration with other people in these movies, some of which included his own family and daughters, who, who in some part contributed to these representations. So if we take Full Metal Jacket, the music was composed by his daughter, mm. who I'm sure would have said what she felt about the movie to her father as they were making it. You know, this idea that he was a controlling recluse, uh, this has been uh, debunked now. Mm. So, you know, the textual interpretations are valid I, and, and, you know, one can make these arguments and I'm not disputing that. But I think what we need to move towards is a more, um, is a more um, rounded picture of, of, of film, which doesn't just read the text, that looks at the actual labour that goes into the creation of the text. Now, we might end up with an answer that actually Kubrick was a harsh taskmaster who had unrealistic demands and expectations of everybody who worked for him, man or woman alike. Mm. And that's probably true, actually. Mm. Um, but yet those people were, by and large, willing to work in the surface of his vision for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, and what we see on the screen is the product of collaboration. He's not a Hitchcock. He thinks it up and then just puts it down there. Yeah. He has a rough idea, mm. might, maybe no idea but doesn't get the, the final idea until a kind of lot of push and pull mm. with his creative, uh, with his creatives and his actors to get the final thing that he realized he was after all along. Mm. Um, so uh, we've moved a little bit away from uh, uh, Judaism and you, your main theme. So I wonder if, you know, this thing we were talking about, about focusing on, masculinity and the way masculinity is represented we can just link that back to um the the, the jewish theme um how would you you know how, how do you think that relates and i suppose we're going back to you know the macho mensch and so on but um maybe just to finish off is there something um that you can you can say about how those things relate to each other yeah i mean one thing i noted and i handily have in an earlier book i wrote <laughs> <laughs> um is one i prepared earlier is that Overwhelmingly, you know, film is a male-dominated industry, and when it comes to re um, the, the filmic representations, in the main, the predominant uh, uh, majority of uh, representations of Jewish men by Jewish filmmakers, and uh, in which women often fare badly if they're there at all. And Woody Allen's films are the classic example of that, by and large. Mm. These Jewish women in Woody Allen's films do not, with a with a not even a handful of ex uh, exceptions come across well and so there is a kind of specifically jewish women in, rather than women in general well i'd say women in general but if we focus on this this representation of masculinity and connect mm. it to the jewish question i'm not saying that it's jewish men who, you know film is male dominated whether you're male or jewish sure. uh, uh, whether you're jewish or non-jewish the issue here is that um when we look at specifically Jewish filmmakers representing Jews on film, by and large, they tend to represent men and women, Jewish women come off badly. Jewish men are, are, are often rejecting Jewish women in favor of non-Jewish women, the, 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 the so-called goddess. So um, if one fits Kubrick into that notion of a Jewish filmmaker, then yes, he's, he's, he might be groundbreaking in some ways, but in other ways, he's just fitting into the pattern of of filmmaking whereby uh, uh, Jewish men tend to get overrepresented at the expense of Jewish women who are sidelined and often depicted in negative ways um, by by those filmmakers. So th there is a kind of connection there mm. um, in, 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 in that sense to, to, to bring it back round. But the interesting thing when we look at Eyes Wide Shut is that it's a Jewish novel um which kubrick kind of turns into a non-jewish film yeah on the surface 
Hmm. So, um, you know, there's another interesting thing going on there at the end when he is depicting what was Jewish masculinity and femininity suddenly becomes seemingly non-Jewish. And then he inserts a wholly invented Jewish character who, um, I'm writing about this at the moment, who a lot of people think was Kubrick's way of warning people about Jeffrey Epstein really? and George Soros. So, but that's another story about Kubrick and conspiracy theories. That's something I'm working on. Right, okay. <laughs> that's a whole other rabbit, Warren. <laughs> okay, maybe for another time then. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this uh, conversation. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah, good, luck. So um, good luck with the, uh, with the new book. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be out next year. Okay. Bye now.